Hi there and welcome to Ancient Magical Artifacts Explained. Today, Solomon's seal has annihilated you, a brass amulet for protection from the 6th century. This brass amulet was made to protect its owner against enemies and a specific evil demon. Its iconography and inscriptions combine Christian, Jewish, Egyptian and Greek elements. Christian and Jewish elements as well as Greek inscriptions occur on both sides while Egyptian and Greek iconography were engraved on one side only. The first editor of the amulet, Alphonse Barb, referred to the side with the Egyptian content as the Gnostic side, and to the other side as the Christian side. Since part of the Christian side could also be interpreted as Jewish, and the Gnostic side rather displays Egyptian, Greek, Jewish and potentially Christian iconography, I suggest the more neutral designation of side A and side B. Site A is inscribed with New Testament narrative imagery and two Greek invocations. Site B contains Egyptian, Jewish and eventually Christian iconography and the invocation of the two Christians Zizinos and B. Zizinos together with Solomon and four archangels. Site A is well preserved, while Site B is damaged in several places. The designs of the two sites are elaborate and carefully planned and their realization is well crafted. The amulet is dated to the 6th century. Nothing is known about its provenance. It measures approximately 6 times 4.5 cm and it is kept at the British Museum in London. Let's take a closer look at Site A of the amulet. Site A is inscribed with four horizontal rows of New Testament narrative imagery, three lines of inscriptions and an inscription along the outer rim encircling the iconography. The iconography in the top row shows a bust of Christ in the center, with a cross-shaped halo inside an oval. This oval is called mandorla. In opposite to a halo, a mandorla encircles the entire body, or here the bust, and not just the head. The bust is elevated above the earth by four flying angels, with an eight-rayed star on either side above them. This version of the ascension of Christ was developed in Syria during the 6th century, and later adopted in Byzantine art. It emphasizes Christ's divinity. Following his ascension, Christ takes a seat at the right hand of God. The iconography in the second row starts to the left with a group of two shepherds. The left one is resting on a staff and raising his hand towards a star. The other shepherd is facing him with a shepherd's crook on his shoulder. There are two ewes behind him. Following to the right is the scene of the birth of Jesus Christ and the adoration of the Magi led by a star preceded by an angel with halo and scepter. The magi are bringing their gifts to the child held by his enthroned mother. Both mother and child are depicted with a halo. In the center of the third row we see Christ standing between two kneeling women. He is depicted with a halo, scepter and raised right hand. The woman on the left touching the hem of his garment is interpreted as the woman healed of the issue of blood. The woman on the right might be interpreted as the Canaanite woman interceding for her daughter. Further to the right is Zacchaeus in the treetop, the man healed of the palsy carrying his bed and another man characterized by the spots on his naked body as a leper. To the left of the center group there is a naked man and it looks as if his hands were tied behind his back. He is interpreted as the demonia graving with two potentially evil spirits in the air to his left and to his right seeming to just leaving him. Behind this demoniac, to the very left of the third row, is a depiction of the blind man washing his eyes in the waters of Siloam. The bottom row shows Christ with a cross-shaped halo, joining a couple in matrimony. The group is standing inside a building which is likely some kind of edicola, a small shrine. The five on forty to the left of the marriage scene extend the subject to the wedding of Cana. The loaves or baskets and two fishes to the right extend the whole group to a symbol of the Eucharist. The miracle of Cana served as a symbol of Christian marriage. These four image rows are separated by three lines of Greek inscriptions. They read, O Lord, give not strength to my enemies as thy right hand protects me everywhere. The right hand is a referral to Jesus Christ and likely to Psalm 110.1. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, meaning bringing them under the control of Jesus. 
Images and text are encircled by another Greek inscription, reading Turn evil unto the heads of those there, O Lord our God. Do not give them power. The Greek term translated here as power is dynamis, commonly occurring in the Greek magical papyri as well as in Gnostic texts and in modern publications often translated as magic. The aim of the inscriptions is clear, to protect the owner of the amulet against enemies and to render these enemies powerless. But it is not stated if the enemies in mind are of human nature or higher powers. We will get back to this question later when we have looked at the iconography in its entirety. Alphonse Barb concludes that these invocations in the language and style of the Septuagint could just as well be Jewish as Christian, but the latter element is added abundantly by the figures. This is the iconography of site A. Let's now take a closer look at site B. The upper half part of the iconography of this side of the amulet was designed symmetrically. In the top center we see a four-winged male figure with a halo, standing on two crocodiles and holding two scorpions in each hand. His knees are decorated with lion masks indicating protection. The face of the deity is that of the Egyptian dwarf protective god Bes, potentially having ram's horns on his head. Inside the halo we can see a scorpion and a crescent. The interpretation of the third sign remains unclear. I wonder if it could represent the flagellum or scorch, which is a sign of rulership of various Egyptian kings and deities, for example Min, Osiris, Horus and the Horus child. The iconography resembles on one hand the type of Horus on the crocodiles, but Horus is usually not depicted with wings. On the other hand, it resembles the type of the Pantheos, who is regularly depicted with wings, but usually standing on a cartouche either containing dangerous animals or an inscription. A few examples show the deity standing on the back of a lion, but we have one other example of him standing on a single crocodile with scorpions to his right and left. Both depictions, Horus and Crocodiles and the winged Pantheos, were popular in ancient Greek or Egyptian magic, and both depictions of the deities represent a protective meaning. In the case of Horus and Crocodiles, especially in context of poisonous, life-threatening stings and bites. The standing on dangerous animals is interpreted in two ways as the deity possessing the specific prowess of those animals and as the overcome animals serving in subaltern positions as protectors. In a comprehensive study on the Pantheos, the Egyptologist Joachim Quack recommends to rather use the term polymorphic deity due to a lack of actual ancient sources providing evidence for the existence of a Pantheos. We still don't have a clear understanding of this ancient deity. To the right, to the left, and above the deity are ancient magic signs. These signs were called characteres, and ongoing research shows that they likely originated in Greek culture. The vast majority of the signs here displays ring endings. While the meaning of most of the signs remains unknown to us so far, the crescent symbol accompanied by the eight pointed star with ring endings to the left of the central figure, underneath the wings, likely represent the sun and the moon. Let's focus on the magic signs for a moment. The fact that most of the signs have ring endings places them in a later Coptic context, where the use of magic signs without ring endings is extremely rare. This later dating wouldn't fit too well with the current suggested dating of the amulet to the 6th century. But the fact that almost none of the signs represent a Greek or Coptic letter, which is typical for this later Coptic use of ring signs, places them into an earlier Coptic, but also a potentially Greek context, prior to and around the 6th century. Because in Greek ritual practice magic signs were predominantly not used to write words, in opposite to the later Coptic use where almost exclusively alphabetic ring signs were used and they were used to write the names of higher powers. But the depicted signs do not reflect the typical Greek use of magic signs either, where we can commonly observe a mixture of signs with ring endings and signs without rings. Therefore, it seems that the combination of types of magic signs on this amulet indicates an intercultural context at the intersection of Christian Egyptian and non-Christian Greek traditions, with a heavier focus on the Egyptian Christian tradition due to the almost exclusive use of ring signs. It is still a rather unusual combination of magic signs, as is the combination of Christian iconography with the Egyptian iconography of the polymorphic deity. The almost exclusive use of ring signs on one hand 
paired with the rare use of alphabetic ring signs on the other, supports the dating around the 6th century. Let's move on to the iconography below the magic signs. The depiction to the left, below the crescent and the sun sign, is damaged and it is difficult to identify it clearly. The animal resembles a lion with a palm branch in front of him, or maybe even in his mouth. In Judaism, the lion is the symbol of the tribe of Judah, which is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. In Christian tradition, the lion is or represents Jesus. In Revelation 5.5 it is said about Jesus, See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. The traces around the lion's tail are interpreted by Bab as a bird without providing an explanation of its potential meaning. The iconography to the right is partially destroyed and thus difficult to identify. Bab suggests an interpretation as an ibis standing on a magic sign. This would be a unique depiction. Magic signs are not attested in any other source with an animal standing upon them in a way that the animal would constitute a part of the sign. It would be more likely that this iconography depicts an ibis on a standard, like we can see on this gold amulet from the 20th century BCE. But as you can see, the iconography doesn't really fit this type too well. There is another ibis type attested on multiple gems, which might come closer to the traces we can observe on our amulet. The ibis on these gems is depicted next to an altar, tied to it with a cord, and the altar adorned with three lines, which are interpreted very differently. As stalks of a plant, as nails symbolizing binding, or as a hieroglyph. While the iconography would fit slightly better with the traces on the bronze amulet, the amulets depicting this ibis type were used in context of digestion and colics and, based on an interpretation provided by Bob, as protection against poisoning. As we will see, none of these overlap with the purpose of this amulet as given in the inscription on this side. But the idea of the ibis as a protector against poisoning does connect to the polymorphic deity holding two defeated scorpions in his hands, considering that scorpions were ubiquitous in Egypt, with all of them being poisonous. Still, there are three critical arguments against the interpretation of an ibis. First, the way it is currently interpreted, the ibis would look to the right, away from the figure and away from the center of the iconography. In terms of the symmetry of the design of the amulet, this is rather unlikely. We would expect the depiction to face towards the figure in the center. Second, the ibis would be pretty small compared to the line. And third, the beak of an ibis is bent not straight, and usually this is depicted correctly on gems and other amulets. But there is also a strong argument for the interpretation of an ibis, but in order to fully understand it, we need to understand the inscription of this site first. Therefore I will place the discussion of this argument at the end of the video, where I discuss some final thoughts about our amulet. Below these depictions are two groups of magic signs, one to the left and one to the right of the two crocodiles. To the right we can see three ring signs, of which we don't know if they had an individual meaning. The signs to the left are very much damaged and difficult to identify. Bab interprets the sign directly next to the crocodiles as the monogram of Christ. The problem with this interpretation is that there is no connecting line between the assumed raw head and the horizontal line underneath it. While we can still recognize individual rings typical for ring signs, we cannot reconstruct the individual shapes of the signs. In addition, the symmetrical layout of the iconography on this side of the amulet indicates that we here have ring signs too, like we have to the right of the crocodiles. But, even though we are not sure about the details of the two animal groups above, we need to take into consideration that the groups represent different religious symbolism. The potential ibis could represent Egyptian tradition, while the line represents Jewish and or Christian symbolism. Based on this consideration, it is well conceivable that we are dealing here, too, with symbolism from different cultural religious backgrounds, with magic signs on the right side representing Greek and Greco-Egyptian traditions, and the signs to the left representing Christian or Jewish symbolism. Underneath the symmetrical top part of the iconography follow seven lines of a Greek inscription which reads Zizinos be Zizinos Tread down the abominable one, that she should not have strength anymore. The seal of Solomon has annihilated thee. Michael, Gabriel, Uriel, Raphael, fetter thee. Alima Bimach. The female abominable one is interpreted as the child-killing female demon Abizu, whom Saint Zizinios conquers. 
Alphonse Barb connected Abizu to the primeval sea in ancient Mesopotamian religion called Abzu. In his paper Antaura, the Mermaid and the Devil's Grandmother, a lecture from 1966, he states that the Devil's Grandmother is none other than our old Sumerian Abzu, the primeval dark ocean of the netherworld, Babylonian Tiamat, bringing forth a horde of evil monsters, Lilith, whom the prophet Elias meets on the way with her family of demons, the Gorgo Abizu, conquered and feathered by King Solomon, the Alabastria, whom Coptic monks portrayed on a wall of their monastery with her daughter and evil offspring, assaulted by St. Cisinios Abyssos, the bottomless pit of revelation, that is hell personified. Abizu is mentioned in detail in the Testament of Solomon, her name here written Obizuth. The dating of the Testament of Solomon is debated. A more recent study by Sarah Schwartz argues that the text or text in fullest form as represented in late medieval manuscripts is actually quite a late development in this tradition's history and that most of the elements which eventually come together under the title Testament of Solomon and the like circulated independently during the late antique period. So who is Abizu and how can the demon be defeated according to the Testament of Solomon? Let's take a closer look and read the passage in the Testament. And there came before me a spirit in woman's form that had a head without any limbs and her hair was disheveled. And I said to her, Who art thou? But she answered, Nay, who art thou? And why dost thou want to hear concerning me? But as thou wouldst learn, here I stand bound before thy face. Go then into thy royal storehouses and wash thy hands. Then sit down afresh before thy tribunal and ask me questions. And thou shalt learn, O king, who I am. And I, Solomon, did as she enjoined me and restrained myself because of the wisdom dwelling in me, in order that I might hear of her deeds and reprehend them and manifest them to men. And I sat down and said to the demon, Who art thou? And she said, I am called among men Obizuth, and by night I sleep not, but go my rounds over all the world, and visit women in childbirth, and divining the hour, I take my stand, and if I am lucky, I strangle the child, but if not, I retire to another place, for I cannot for a single night retire unsuccessful, for I am a fierce a spirit, a myriad names and many shapes. And now hither, now thither I roam, and to westering parts I go my rounds. But as it is now, though thou hast sealed me round with the ring of God, thou hast done nothing. I am not standing before thee, and thou wilt not be able to command me, for I have no work other than the destruction of children, and the making their ears to be deaf, and the working of evil to their eyes, and the binding their mouths with a bond and the ruin of their minds, and paining of their bodies. When I, Solomon, heard this, I marveled at her appearance, for I beheld all her body to be in darkness. But her glance was altogether bright and greeny, and her hair was tossed widely like a dragon's, and the whole of her limbs were invisible, and her voice was very clear as it came to me. And I cunningly said, Tell me, by what angel thou art frustrated? O evil spirit. But she answered me, By the angel of God called Afaroth, which is interpreted Raphael, by whom I am frustrated now and for all time. His name, if any man know it, I am right the same on a woman in childbirth. Then I shall not be able to enter her. Of this name, the number is 640. The text provides a detailed impression of the demon, including a way to defeat her by writing down a secret name of the angel Aphorov. But the name is not given, only its number, 640. This is an example of ancient isopsephy, in which the individual numerical values of Greek letters of a name or a word are added up to a single number. For example, the numerical value of the seven Greek letters of the name of the ancient higher power and great archon Abrasax is 365 the number of days of the year. So the testament of Solomon tells us how to defeat the demon, but does not reveal the needed name, just its isopsephic number. 
The open question is if it would have been sufficient to write down this number for an efficient protection. While according to the Testament of Solomon, knowing the secret name would be the only way to protect against and defeat the evil demon, our amulet tells about an additional option by referring to the Saint Cisinios, the Seal of Solomon, and the four archangels Michael, Gabriel, Uriel and Raphael. Let's take a look at another bronze amulet addressing the Seal of Solomon and Cisinios to defeat the demon Abuso. The amulet is in private hands and has been dated by Geoffrey Speer to the early Byzantine period, which is roughly between the 4th and the 8th century. The inscriptions read, The Seal of Solomon is with the one wearing it. And, Flee, flee, Abuso, Cisinios and Cisinia pursue you. The standing figure is called Alaf in the inscription. By the way, Alaf cannot be the name referred to in the Testament of Solomon, since the numeric value of its letters is 632. Interesting side fact, while amulets like this are interpreted to ensure that their owner is protected from miscarriage and the death of an infant, Jeffrey Speer mentions in his paper about medieval Byzantine magical amulets that two or four preserved personal names on the amulets he studied are male, suggesting that Abizu was thought to cause harm to women and to men as well. Since Abizu was understood as a child-killing demon and the preserved personal names on these amulets are female and male, I wonder if these amulets were worn by children. Below the inscription and constituting the bottom section of the iconography on this side are two lines, standing to the right and to the left of a central hexagram facing towards it. Above each line is a crescent and an 8-rayed star. Ah, here we get a new hint in terms of the reconstruction of the damaged part of the line above. Instead of a bird, the traces might belong to an 8-pointed star and a crescent. The hexagram here could be interpreted as the Star of David or the Shield of David, especially in the context of the two lines. The symbol was not a uniquely Jewish symbol in antiquity. It became widespread in Jewish magical texts and amulets during the early Middle Ages. But the motive of two lines flanking a sacred emblem is popular in the art of the synagogue from antiquity throughout the Middle Ages up to modern times. This would support the interpretation of the hexagram here as a Jewish symbol and as the Star of David or the Shield of David. Alphonse Barb goes one step further and interprets the sign as the actual seal of Solomon. If the interpretation of the hexagram as the Star of David would be correct, it would symbolize especially kingship, employing power over others, but also cohesion and unity. As the Shield of David, it would symbolize protection. According to Jewish legend, the hexagram decorated the shield of King David when he fought King Nimrod. In the 2nd century, Rabbi Akiva is said to have chosen the Star of David as the symbol of Bar Kokhba's revolt against the Roman Emperor Hadrian. When thinking about the meaning of the hexagram here on the amulet, we have to take into consideration its pre-Islamic dating to the 6th century, when the symbol was not as widespread and popular as it became later. Based on the overall iconography, as well as the content of the inscriptions, a protective meaning in combination with symbolizing kingship and power over others seems to be a reasonable assumption. The center of the hexagram is damaged, but there are still traces of an origin decoration visible, though too vague for an interpretation. At the top of the hexagram is a sign consisting of three lines with ring endings. This sign occurs repeatedly in Coptic ritual manuals on top of the heads of higher powers. Therefore I suggest an interpretation as a kind of crown or as a symbol indicating rulership. The iconography on this side is completely surrounded by the Ouroboros along the rim of the amulet, in contrast to the iconography of side A, which is encircled by an inscription. The purpose of both encirclings is the same, protection, so that nothing from the outside can harm what is inside, meaning that the power of the images, symbols and words inscribed here is protected against potential attacks. Here are some final thoughts about the amulet. Let's start with the argument for the interpretation of an ibis, which we didn't pursue earlier because we needed to understand the inscription on this side first. This inscription mentions the seal of Solomon, destroying an evil demon, and asks the saints Zizinos and B. Zizinos to tread down the demon Abuso. Take a look at this silver-plated copper amulet from Smyrna, which has two inscriptions. One reads, Seal of Solomon, banish all evil from the wearer, while the other reads, flee, detested one. Solomon, Zizinios and Zizinarios pursue you. 
The iconography shows on one side the rider saying trampling a female figure lying beneath the horse. The other side depicts the evil eye being attacked by three knives, two lions, an ibis, a snake and a scorpion, with the same female figure lying beneath the animals. Due to one of the inscriptions mentioning Zizinios, the female figure is interpreted as the female child-killing demon Abuso. Björkelund interprets the evil eye here as functionally equivalent to, and interchangeable with, this demon. The occurrence of the ibis on the Smyrna amulet, which has the same context as our amulet, makes it seem possible that an ibis was also engraved on our amulet. One question will remain. What about the snake? While we do have the Ouroboros, this symbolizes a different concept than the attacking snake on the Smyrna amulet. The engraving of our amulet is badly damaged here, and at this point we cannot go beyond conjecture. Each side of the amulet is dedicated to an individual purpose. The inscriptions on side A aim to protect the one who wears the amulet against unnamed enemies by depriving them of their strength and power and turning evil onto their heads. The power of protection is granted by the Christian God and the Ascended Jesus. In addition, the iconography depicts predominantly healing scenes mentioned in the Gospels. Exceptions are the birth of Jesus Christ with the adoration of the Magi, the ascension of Christ and the wedding scene. In antiquity, diseases were believed to be caused by male volunteer powers. The scenes of birth and marriage seem to indicate the context of the desired protection, marriage and childbirth, while the ascension of Jesus indicates his divine power and power over his enemies. Thus, inscriptions and iconography combined define the enemies, the threat, the context and the protectors. The inscription on site B aims to protect the bearer of the amulet against a specific female demon who can be identified as the child-killing Abuso. The protectors here are the two saints Zizinos and Bizizinos and the Seal of Solomon. But what is the function of the iconography on this side? Since the inscription provides enemy, threat, context and protectors already, why were these graphical elements added? The answer might be simple. To increase the power of the amulet by combining powers from different cultures and belief systems. And to combine different visual manifestations or representations of power, the written word, images and symbols, instead of relying on one source only. Combining powers from different cultures and belief systems here indicates that the creator and the bearer of the amulet knew about and believed in pagan, pre-Christian, polytheistic, syncretistic traditions, willing to take the risk of being prosecuted considering the dating of the amulet to the 6th century. At this time, Christianity is the dominant religion in the Roman Empire under Justinian I. Keeping in mind that the famous temple of Isis at Philae in Egypt, until then the last officially tolerated pagan sanctuary in the empire, was closed by imperial troops around 536, that the accusation of secret paganism developed into a popular instrument to incriminate disagreeable members of the upper class, and that Justinian ordered the persecution of non-Christian grammarians, rhetors, physicians and legal scholars in 545-546 and had pagan books publicly burned in 562, the awareness of the danger could have led to the decision to create a safe iconography for Site A, which is entirely based on elements related to Christian belief, and to include pagan elements exclusively on site B. Site A would then have been worn as the visible site and site B as the hidden one. The polymorphic deity is presented here in his competence as a most powerful protective deity depicting his enemies under his feet, meaning they are under his control. His protective powers comprise defeating diseases as well as defeating enemies and thus show a parallel to the powers of God in Christ on site A. The interpretation of the hexagram as the Jewish symbol of the shield of David on one hand and the star of David on the other would add a third powerful protective ruler source to the iconography of the amulet. Taking into consideration that while the pagan Greco-Egyptian syncretistic belief systems and Christianity portrayed their gods and higher powers, in Judaism God is never portrayed in any image, the hexagram would be the strongest iconographic symbol to represent Jewish divine power. How about the magic signs? The archaeological record and especially the ancient ritual manuals teach us that these signs were understood in several different ways. There was not one single concept on which the application in ritual practice was based upon, nor one school of thought. 
we can see that here on our amulet, the signs were not used as a sacred script, like they were in later Coptic sources, since most of the signs do not represent letters. In Greek ritual practice, the signs are attested, among others, in protective contexts, and they were addressed as protective higher powers themselves. They were also understood as power-bearing devices, and in the Gnostic text of the books of Yoy, magic signs were assigned to individual higher powers. Current research indicates a predominant understanding of magic signs in ancient Greek magic as signs embodying in either an abstract force or representing an individual higher power, comparable to the concept of higher powers having secret names. Knowing the name can bring a higher power under your control. Knowing a magic sign may have been understood as being able to focus a specific power of the higher power and bring it under your control. In terms of our amulet, there are two ways of interpreting the signs here. As supportive forces of the three depicted major belief systems in late antiquity, Christian, Jewish and the syncretistic polytheistic system we find in the Egyptian Greco-Roman magical papyri. Or as a fourth force being understood as either equal in power to the three above-mentioned belief systems or as power-inherent representations of a force system. Research isn't advanced enough yet to provide a solid database for reliable argumentation at this point, but I'll keep you updated on the progress of my research about ancient magic science here and on my other social media channels. You can see how challenging it can be to identify and interpret the iconography of an ancient magical artifact. Thanks for listening and watching. I hope you enjoyed it. You can find the references I made during the video in the description below, as well as a link to more images of the artifact.